But thank you, everybody, for joining us today for the Ultrasound Grand Rounds this week. I'm pretty excited to have you all join uh, for today. I know we were just chatting a little bit offline here uh, earlier about just some, you know, interesting things going on with the, the hospital and with uh, articles and all sorts of good stuff. But um, thank you for being here for this topic. We're going to be talking with uh, Dr. Shaman today, Dr. Ziad Shaman from the MICU, uh, who's going to be presenting to us uh, today about ventilator weaning uh, with bedside ultrasound. So this is a topic that I asked him to, to kind of present to us. He's been doing some diaphragm work with, uh, with ultrasound. I know it's something we don't necessarily do a lot in the ED. And so I thought it'd be an interesting and unique perspective as always. So without further taking more time. I'm just going to turn things over to Z and uh, have him talk to us about uh, diaphragm and ventilators and all sorts of good stuff with ultrasound. So Z, take it away. All right. Th thank you, Matt. Um, so although although weaning is not something that, that a lot of a lot of it happens in, in the AD, uh, but the technique of looking at the diaphragm and, and, and looking at weaning parameters might become interesting for other applications. So it's an interesting topic Overall, although it might not be applicable immediately, but, but you'll see how it could be useful. So let's start with some objectives uh, I have uh, here to, to discuss the mechanics in uh, failure of weaning from, from the ventilator. Also, the second one is to evaluate the diaphragm function using ultrasound. And the third is to talk about potential causes of diaphragmatic dysfunction. So um, we'll start with a case and we'll, we'll follow the case uh, during the, the presentation. So here's Mr. Puffer um, that uh, Netter talked about a long time ago. Uh, he is a 60 year old male with a fetal exacerbation of COPD. He comes to the emergency room because of hypoxia. Feeling short of breath, 82% on his usual four liters uh, O2. Uh, he's do not resuscitate, but he is okay with intubation. Uh, the blood gas shows acidosis, respiratory, acute on chronic. And while on a non breather, the oxygen PaO2 is, is very high, which you, you don't like. So you put the patient on BiPAP, try to fix the hypercapnia with 14 over four and eight liters of oxygen. Uh, this results in a saturation of 92%. You're happy, but the patient is not. The patient starts pulling on the mask, saying he can't breathe. Uh, he's very anxious and uh, with psychomotor education. So you give the patient a Dilaudid of 0.2. You're being very cautious. However, the GCS drops and you end up in two patients. So the CT head is normal and you admit to the MICU. And of course, with an x-ray that happened before, this is a representative x-ray, of course, of a female, that's not exactly the patient. But there is a lung that's hyperinflated. And the diaphragms are so far down that they look like they're inverted, almost. So severe hyperinflation, inverted in the diaphragm. What do you expect to see in a severe COPD patient? You realize that this puts, puts pressure, this pressure put on the diaphragm makes them uh, less effective in ventilation, and in addition to airway obstruction, the disadvantaged position of the diaphragm uh, is, is partly uh, the cause of the hypercapnia. So days one to six, everything goes according to plan. So the patient has already started an appropriate treatment in the ED, including Tamiflu, flu season, steroids, bronchodilators, and the patient is put on is on the mechanical ventilation at 420 cc's total volume, rate of 16, and FiO2 of 35 and a heat of 5. With these settings, the resistance is 25 and the compliance is 35, and the patient has an auto peak of 7. We don't usually use resistance compliance in the ED, uh, but uh, new machines are coming. Uh, are coming to the ED, so you might actually see those parameters. Uh, a resistance normally is uh, on the ventilator is about a 10. And uh, the higher it goes, the worse the situation is. Once you go above 25, then it's a problem. Uh, a compliance on the ventilator is usually in a, in a healthy lung is about 50. And the lower it goes, the worse it is. And at a compliance of 25, the patient is in trouble. With the following, with those settings, the patient's CO2 is reasonable at 55, it's compensated, which is uh, with a bicarb of 31, which is the patient's baseline. 
And then it's time to get the patient off the ventilator. So you do a rapid shallow breathing index assessment, which is the respiratory rate divided by the tidal volume that the patient spontaneously generates, and you get an 80. And after 30 minutes, the number becomes 100. And then after 30 minutes, which is one hour total, the number is 120. And you remember that a cutoff of 105 or 100 uh, is, is the limit of um, what is reasonable for extubation. 120 is a little bit too much. And this, there might be pulmonary vascular disease because the CVP is 20. There is a history of pulmonary hypertension for the patient, but, but there is no known PE. Uh, the strength of the patient, peripheral uh, muscle strength is four out of five. And you think this might relate to central muscle strength, which is core and diaphragm. You confirm this with a negative respiratory force of minus 20, which is kind of on the cutoff of, of leanable from the ventilator. Minus 30 is better than minus 20. But the patient goes on a pressure support trial with, um, with the mechanical ventilator and is extruded. That night, the fellow has to rain to the patient. Um, this happened because of hypercapnic respiratory failure and failure to respond to bifelt. So why did the patient fail? We usually look up, uh, the, the workup that we do usually includes looking at the airways, at the parenchyma and at the effort, assuming that the brain is working fine. So the maximum, so, so for the airways, of course, the resistance is the key here. And uh, if you have pressure me measurements and flow measurements, then you can calculate the resistance and see where the patient is compared to baseline. If you don't, you're gonna use the stethoscope to listen for prolonged exhalation and look at wave uh, parameters on the ventilator to look at air trapping. And you're gonna decide if the airway resistance is a problem or a new problem or an added problem. Then looking at the parenchyma, usually we look at compliance, which is the volume divided by pressure. But if you don't have those parameters, you're gonna look at a chest X-ray, you're gonna look at a CT scan uh, to decide if there's a parenchymal disease, a thorax or a fusion uh, or pulmonary congestion, something like that. Then looking at the diaphragm, the maximum inspiratory pressure or the NIF or the MIF or the PI max is all the same, is a global assessment of the strength of the inspiratory muscle. Not just the diaphragm, but all of the inspiratory muscle. It can be measured by attaching an aneroid manometer, which is a dry manometer, to the opening of the endotracheal tube and asking the patient to maximally inspire against an occluded airway. So initial studies looked at a NIF of minus 30 or more negative than that, and those were associated with good while a NIF of minus 20 or closer to zero, then that were associated with brain failure. But there were subsequent studies, multiple of them, and eventually a meta-analysis uh, referenced here looked at 30 studies and found that the uh, MIT or the NIF is, is a poor predictor of winning outcomes. And one reason, uh, or the main reason, probably in, in the case of this patient for sure, is that the um, the predictive capacity of the NIF uh, only assesses the uh, respiratory muscle strength and not the workload uh, on the patient. Uh, in addition, there is uh, the accurate measurement of, of the NIF depends on the patient's effort. So it's, it's even suggested that uh, it's even suggested that um, to, uh, to to create enough uh, will in the patient and to encourage the patient to create maximum negative inspiratory force, you're supposed to use a one-way uh, valve that allows the patient to exhale but not inhale. And you leave it there for 20, 25 seconds. It's a pretty tough task. Uh, nevertheless, uh, really, you, you're, you will not assess the, uh, the mechanics imposed on the patient. So this is a, a famous study that looked at um, a product of the time and pressure uh, of the respiratory effort and uh, created uh, what, what is known as the fatigue threshold. If, uh, so the, pr the product of the, of the effort and the time needed to overcome respiratory load predicts which patient is going to do well. And the product of the two is called the uh, TT of the diaphragm, the time, uh, time, pressure, time pressure product of the diaphragm. The effort is the pressure generated by the diaphragm to achieve inspiration as proportion as a proportion to the maximum pressure that the diaphragm can generate. 
So how much do you need to generate to, for a breath compared to the maximum that you can generate? And you multiply this by the time of inspiration compared, compared or in proportion to the total time of the respiratory cycle. So note here that the ratio of the time of inspiration over the total time available usually becomes, becomes higher because of tachypnea, which eats up from the total uh, or, or lowers the total respiratory, uh, total, uh, respiratory time. So it's not really that inhalation takes longer, but exhalation becomes less available for the patient. That's why uh, TI over T total becomes, a, uh, becomes a, uh, a higher number. So the product of the two uh, for, for a person who is, who is breathing, um, uh, sustained breathing falls into, into this area, the red area. Uh, this is someone who's going to fail uh, weaning in, in less than one hour. And uh, for someone uh, who falls in the green area, this is someone who is okay to exclude. So you, you take this information and you want to apply it to the patient, but the rapid shower breathing index doesn't take much of this into account. So each of the respiratory parameters that we use, uh, the vital tidal volume, the frequency, NIF, vital capacity, minute ventilation, by itself is not a good predictor. And that, that's why the rapid shower breathing, breathing index was, was developed, which is the tidal volume, divide, the respiratory rate divided by tidal volume. But the rapid shower in, breathing index, although it's it's simple and it's powerful. It did not work for our patients because the workload is very high because of COPD, airway obstruction, and because his muscle strength is compromised because he has a flat diaphragm and the mechanics are disadvantageous in that situation. So maybe uh, by using the rapid shower breathing index uh, uh, and, and incorporating some of the time and pressure parameters, you can come up with a better parameter to predict if your patient is going to uh, to um, to wean well from the ventilator, and here enters the, the weaning index W R, not a very creative name but an intuitive one, and it takes into account the rapid shower breathing index multiplied by something called the elasticity index, which is a fancy way to say peak pressure divided by NIF or negative negative inspiratory force, and then the ventilatory demand index, which is just the minute ventilation divided by ten. Actually, this can be very nicely simplified into a weaning index that is frequency or respiratory rate squared times peak pressure divided by NIF times 10. And it comes up, it results in a number that's very similar to the rapid shower weaning index. And, and the predictive values here, the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value were, are really good. Uh, so you take this to the patient, uh, the next day after intubation, and uh, you, imagine, you, you examine the patient, of course, to see what's the resistance, what's the compliance, what's the work index, and you find out that uh, here the, the resistance is 40 minus 17, which is peak minus plateau, divided by flow, which is 1, 60 liters per minute is 1, and you end up with a number that's 23. You say, okay, this is similar to what we had, and then you get a compliance, uh, you divide the tidal volume, spontaneous volume of the patient for 20 let's say divided by uh, 12, which is plateau minus teeth, and you get uh, a num number of 35, still similar to what the patient has. And then you calculate the work in uh, the weaning index. And for that, you want the frequency twice, so 20 times 20, divided by the peak pressure, which is 14. You divide this by, by the uh, NIF, which is 20 uh, and 10. So the answer here is 80. Um, and then you say, well, the rapid shower breathing index was also 80. Um, uh, um, I, I think I, I, if, if this is true, then maybe the patient should be excavated. And then the fellow says to you, uh, well, wait a minute. I'm worried about this weaning index thing. I, I want to show you something. Let's, let's look at the patient's diaphragm. So comparing the pre-admission CAT scan to the current CAT scan that the patient got after reintubation and uh, the fellow says, uh, I think this man has diaphragmatic weakness. Uh, so look at the diaphragm here, uh, pre-admission. It looks, uh, I don't know what the normal is, but it looks thicker than it is now. And let's go measure something. Um, and so, so this, this study, uh, this study uh, refers to, to, to a report by John, where he used 
CAT scans, uh, spiral CTs to assess the volume of the diaphragm and reported that the volume of the diaphragm in critically ill patients, there are 23 of them, was no different from control on admission. Uh, however, after 25 days, uh, the volume of the diaphragm decreased by 11% in those who were non-septic and 27% in those who were septic compared to baseline. However, in the same study by John, uh, the, the diaphragm volume was, was weakly correlated with diaphragmatic strength measured by uh, something called the uh, airway twitch, which is you stimulate the phrenic nerve magnetically and, and you measure the airway pressure. So, um, the, the fellow goes in uh, and, and does some measurements and comes out and says, uh, look, I found an excursion of 30 millimeters and a fractional short shortening or thickening, a fraction th thickening fraction of 33%. Uh, therefore, uh, I'm gonna try to see what, what that means. So what, what, what you can use here is two different uh, parameters, the uh, diaphragmatic displacement or excursion which uh, determines the, the movement of the diaphragm, the whole diaphragm, uh, and it's non-invasive way to assess its, uh, its function or dysfunction. And then the thickness or thickening, there are actually two numbers, thickness, absolute number, and thickening, the change in the, in the, in the width of the diaphragm at the zone of opposition. And thickening uh, is, is uh, during active breathing, is something similar to the left ventricular ejection fraction, something like that. So um, how, how do you use this? You're used to looking at the diaphragm excursion. Of course, you're, you're looking at the diaphragm usually from the, from the lateral aspect um, and the diaphragm moves during inhalation downwards and during exhalation uh, upwards. Uh, so downwards is, is, uh, is this way, caudal. The dot here is in the encephalic uh, orientation. Uh, and this, this diaphragm, uh, the, the lateral third of the, or posterior third of the diaphragm is uh, sometimes easily visible, sometimes not. If the lung covers the diaphragm, you have a certain sign, you can't see much of the dome of the diaphragm. Uh, so for the technique, you, you, you're looking at the ca caudal displacement of the posterior third of the hemidiaphragm. You're gonna use a curvilinear probe, low frequency, three and a half to five megahertz, and you're gonna use 2D mode initially. Put the probe in the subcostal area, mid clavicular all the way to anterior axillary, whichever gives you the best view of the posterior portion of the diaphragm, posterior third. And you're gonna to, 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 to get that, you aim the probe medially, cranially, of course, and, and dorsally to, towards the back a little bit. And you run M mode. And with M mode, you're gonna look at the displacement, you can look at other parameters like contraction speed and super time total and total respiratory. Uh, time. So you put the probe again in the, in the, on the anterior aspect, either in the midclavicular all the way to the anterior axillary line on either side. On the left, you're going to get less of a, of a uh, size of a screen, which will make the diaphragm a little bit less visible, I guess. And on the right side, you get a little bit more of the diaphragm. Because the beam runs uh, quite perpendicular to the, to, to, the, to, the, to the diaphragm, you're going to get a really good picture when you run M mode. Uh, you want to, uh, you, of course, when the diaphragm moves caudally, it's going to move towards the probe and the signal is going to move up uh, towards the top of the screen. And when the patient exhales, the diaphragm is going to go down. The difference between the, the lowest point of the diaphragm and the highest point of the diaphragm is the diaphragmatic excursion. And uh, the, this is where you, you do the measurement, the lowest point, the highest point. But, but you want to be, you want to be careful because sometimes you get a diaphragm that moves in the opposite direction. You might not realize this just by running M mode. So remember to look at the diaphragm and see if the diaphragm is paralyzed or if it's moving in a different direction. So this is someone with a large pleural effusion causing collapse of the lung, and the diaphragm is moving cephalad during inhalation rather than caudal during inhalation. Uh, this is not uh, this is not uncommon when you uh, when you drain fluid and the lung inflates, the diaphragm actually becomes uh, starts to move in, in the right orientation. So just to tell you that the distance might, might, might be there, but it could be a paralyzing diaphragm that you're looking at. And this is not, uh, not, not, not a crazy idea. This happens uh, uh, quite, quite often that with a large effusion, and here the orientation is in the cardiac mode uh, flip picture, 
So the diaphragm moves up during inhalation uh, rather than down. And uh, after draining the fluid, the diaphragm starts uh, kind of fixing itself. All right. Uh, so um, you get the measurement and then you look up the literature. So there has been a, quite a few studies that looked at, uh, at uh, the diaphragmatic excursion and, and, uh, and, and function using ultrasound. So the first study by uh, Matamis uh, looked at uh, just the detailed technical description and studies of measurements, and there were quite a few after. There is a test uh, looked at inter-observer uh, variability and found that the variability was, was really low, about four to 6% in, in hands of experts, but in the novice, it was between 15 and 32% variability. Uh, Toledo reported that ultrasound was as good as fluoroscopy, uh, but ultrasound showed uh, more movement than fluoroscopy by on average uh, 17 millimeters more. And Ayub looked at uh, the chain muscular dystrophy patients comparing the tidal volume and excursion. The two correlated very well in a linear fashion, R of 0.8. Kim looked at excursion in patients with um, uh, uh, excursion in patients who were on, on, uh, on a spontaneous breathing trial. Uh, and found it to be less than 10, if, if there was, sorry, if there was less than 10 millimeter excursion on uh, during spontaneous training trial, uh, the, those patients were more likely to fail extubation, 68% compared to 41% for those who had an excursion of more than um, more than 10, uh, 10 millimeters or more. And then uh, there are uh, two more studies uh, uh, that I'll go over here. So Suget's, uh, tested uh, 210 individuals using three maneuvers, and uh, those numbers are what we usually use as the standard. So for quiet breathing, 10 millimeters on average, a little bit different between male and female. And for deep breathing, it's about 40 uh, or 50 uh, millimeters excursion. And I noticed that uh, with quiet breathing, uh, the diaphragm uh, excursion is measurable in all uh, in, in all uh, patients, 210. Uh, and in, uh, sorry, those are patients and subjects. And for deep breathing, uh, the, the excursion uh, was measurable in, uh, on the right side better than on the left. Uh, only a quarter of those uh, were measurable on the left side. And the sniffing created a, an excursion that's about twice as it is for quiet breathing. Uh, and, the, and the measurement was, was really um, available to, to the operator. And uh, again, similar numbers uh, from, uh, from the, the other study here by uh, Contrasi, uh, where uh, the excursion was about 50 millimeters with deep breathing. Uh, again, uh, females had a little bit less excursion than males. Uh, those who are underweight compared to normal or obese, and those who are younger compared to older had less excursion. And uh, introduced the idea and maybe thoracic cage restriction is a problem, and the intercostal muscles aren't working as well, so you have to move the diaphragm more to generate the same size of breath in obese folks or in older folks. But the uh, Umbrello uh, studied uh, post-op patients who are on an SPT and uh, and looked at these uh, who are on SPT uh, with different loading uh, measurements, either SPT with zero pressure support, with five pressure support, or fifteen pressure support, and measured the pressure time product, the TPT, uh, 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 with, with an esophageal uh, balloon, and, and failed to show or showed that there was no difference in, uh, in, uh, in, in the diaphragmatic excursion uh, in different loading situations. Pressure support of 15 to 5 to 0 didn't result in a, in a, different, in a different excursion, but introduced a new idea that maybe it's not the excursion that matters, but maybe it's isovolemic contractility or thickening of the diaphragm is what, what really uh, predicts successful weaning. And, and found that there was a significant difference uh, in those who were on pressure support of zero had to thicken the diaphragm much more than those who were on a pressure support of 15. So there was a, a high um, R value and it was significant for uh, uh, for pressure difference and thickening uh, correlation. So what is thickening and how can you how can you measure it? First, you find the zone of opposition. 
so the zone of upper position. So this is a schematic of, of, um, of the relationship between the rib cage to the right lung here and, and the upper abdominal content. And the zone of opposition is this area where the, the, the diaphragm touches the uh, pleura uh, on the, on, at the lower angle of, of the chest. So on the left is, is, are the anatomical structures uh, enlarged here. You have the, um, uh, the parietal pleura, the diaphragm, and the parietal peritoneum all, all together. And, and uh, first, what happens is during inspiration, the diaphragm fibers shorten, and the diaphragm as a whole moves caudally. Uh, and then the reduction in pleural pressure brings the lung into view right there. And it might occlude your picture if you're scanning laterally. Um, and then accompanying the scent of the diaphragm as the cage comes off because of increased uh, abdominal, abdominal pressure. So at the zone of opposition, uh, you will put the ultrasound and, and you see the diaphragm as this three layered structure. The pleura uh, uh, and the peritoneal uh, lines are gonna be hyperechoic. And we'll see a couple of examples here. Uh, this is the pleural line, this is the peritoneal line and, and the diaphragm in between is hypoechoic comparatively. In, a, in the diaphragm, you might have a line uh, that of hyperechoic, of echogenicity that is normal just because muscle fibers are not uniform. This site is, is ideal for diaphragmatic uh, visualization because the diaphragm is bounded by soft tissue on both sides and because the diaphragm is parallel to the, to the face of the problem, perpendicular to the beam. The diaphragm is, uh, is dynamically identified and you, you're using a mode and you measure uh, you measure the, the change in, uh, in the depth or the width of the diaphragm uh, between um, end exhalation. So here's the, the thickness of end exhalation and the thickness of end inhalation. And uh, you, you get a ratio, and that ratio is called the thinning, thickening uh, fraction multiplied by, by 100. So uh, the structures uh, encountered by the ultrasound again from the top to the bottom are from from uh, the skin downwards is in the skin. The soft tissues that uh, uh, depend on the body habitus of the patient. Uh, and then you see the intercostal muscles sometimes if you're between the ribs. Uh, and those uh, three muscles create one bundle. It's about one centimeter thick. And below that you get, uh, you get the parietal and visceral pleural together creating a very bright line uh, right there, about uh, 0.1 uh, millimeters. And then you get the diaphragm that's hypoechoic. And then after the diaphragm, you get the uh, visceral peritoneum, parietal and visceral, visceral peritoneum thickness of again 0.1 uh, millimeters. And you run, you run M mode on it. This is uh, my diaphragm. I just uh, wanted to make sure I can actually see something. And it does, it does, it does look reasonable. Although if you're not, if you're not focused in and zoomed in, you might miss. The diaphragm because it is it is a thinner structure, about a centimeter in width on average. And during inhalation, the lung comes in and might uh, uh, separate, push the diaphragm out of the way, and you might not see it uh, if you're too high in the chest. You run M mode and you you do your measurements. You're gonna uh, you're you're gonna get the smallest measurement, and, and this is going to be uh, exhalation, and the widest measurement is going to be inhalation. In this case, uh, 0.22 centimeters for um, for uh, exhalation and 0.29 for for inhalation, which gives you a thickening fraction of 32 percent. So, um, all of the references for uh, thickness started by measuring the thickness of the diaphragm before uh, thickening fraction of the levers, uh, and uh, and uh, weight uh, showed that. Uh, uh, ultrasound can measure the, 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 the thickness of the diaphragm very reliably, as good as a ruler in cadavers. And then uh, Cohen uh, showed the, uh, showed the, on, on cadavers and on, on living uh, subjects that the measurement uh, is, uh, is accurate, uh, but it, it's not a linear relationship because it depends on uh, where you are in the, in the respiratory cycle and where you're doing the measurement. If you're at RV, 
uh, versus at TLC or somewhere in between. Most of the measurements are done at at uh, functional residual capacity, which is somewhere around 25 and 50 percent of vital capacity. And these measurements were done in upright individuals, uh, seven male and two female, uh, but most of our patients are not upright. And, and there is something else that changes is that with time, uh, the diaphragm uh, thickness can change. Uh, and this is a study um, that looked uh, longitudinally at the width of the diaphragm, or thickness of the diaphragm uh, uh, in patients who are on mechanical ventilation. And in most patients, thickness of the diaphragm decreased with time. Uh, a couple of patients actually had an increase, which was odd, uh, but majority of them had a decrease in diaphragm, 77%, and 20% uh, didn't have a change in, in their diaphragm. Uh, so it's not a static measurement, it does change with time. Lots of studies were done to look at uh, this in part to clarify this information. Uh, thickening fraction studies started coming in. Uh, and Boone looked at functional residual capacity thickness being more than one and a half uh, 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 millimeters, uh, mean of uh, 3.3 millimeters, uh, predicted a thickening of more than 20% at maximum saturation. Uh, Baldwin looked at supine posture uh, and found that inter-rater reliability was very high at residual volume and multiple vital capacity fractions. And Vivier, uh, similar to Umbrello in the past, uh, had uh, looked at post-extubation patients with uh, non-invasive uh, pressure support of 5, 10, and 15 centimeters and had an esophageal, esophageal balloon to measure the uh, product uh, between time and pressure of the diaphragm uh, and the uh, thickness fraction and found that uh, both increased, both the, the, the pressure and the thickness fraction in a linear fashion uh, with, um, with non-invasive ventilation. And Golger looked at thickness thickening fraction of 20% during tidal, be be uh, tidal breathing in mechanically ventilated patients was easier to perform on the right side. As, uh, as, so you can stick with the right side if you think both diaphragms are functioning equally. And Oki looked at thickening fraction and uh, MIP and those were significantly correlated with, uh, uh, with an R value of 0.8. And Harper looked at a wide range, found that there was a wide range uh, of thickness, um, thick, thickness measurement between 1.2 to 11 millimeters, and uh, thickness fraction uh, was uh, between was 20% plus minus 15%. Uh, then Ferrari came and looked at uh, something in particular. Uh, uh, looked at what what cutoff uh, would work uh, for uh, successful extubation versus failure of extubation, and in in the, in their report uh, they they said that uh, a cutoff of thirty six percent thickening fraction uh, predicts successful weaning with a really good sensitivity and a really good specificity uh, compared to rapid shallow breathing index uh, performed uh, pretty well. Uh, however. For, for our patient uh, who, uh, who had a thickening, thickening fraction of 33%, uh, the number falls below the 36% that was seen to be useful in, in Ferrari's study. Uh, however, th this 33% is still uh, better, than, uh, better than someone who is stuck on a ventilator, uh, who is partially supported ventilator or with you know, muscular blockade. Uh, it's pretty close to someone who, who is a healthy subject at rest. Uh, but, but our patient failed because he is not a healthy subject at rest. He had a lot of uh, pulmonary issues and, and, and a, a disadvantaged diaphragm. So Vivier uh, looked at uh, this uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a structured way, trying to see does thickening of the of the of the of the diaphragm in 150 patients who succeeded or failed excavation from mechanical ventilation uh, to see if the measurement can predict who's going to successfully excavate or not. And there was really no difference in, uh, in looking at, uh, at the hemidiaphragm thickening between uh, patients who excavated successfully and those who failed. Uh, the negative uh, values here uh, 
tell you that some of the patients have actually a paralyzed uh, hemidiaphragm in, in the assessment. Um, and, and also confirmed that excursion, the diaphragmatic excursion by itself, does not predict successful, uh, successful extubation. So here is the left and the left side and the right side. And there was no noticeable difference between those who uh, successfully came off the ventilator and, and those who did not. So, so far we know that uh, uh, diaphragmatic excursion is an interesting uh, thing. It can help you decide if the diaphragm is paralyzed or not, uh, unless there is a light pericard pleural effusion, but it does not predict diaphragmatic function. Uh, thickness and thickening, thickening in particular, can tell you if the diaphragm is functioning well or not, but it might not be useful in predicting who's going to successfully excavate or not uh, from mechanical ventilation. So here come a new other, a few new other things uh, that I wanted to talk about, and these uh, only came up in the past uh, couple of years. Um, so may maybe thickness and thickening and displacement is not not the uh, not the right item to look at. So there is speckle tracking. Uh, there is shear wave elastography, elastography, and there is parasternal intercostal muscle assessment. So I'll go over those one by one. So uh, speckle tracking. The image of the diaphragm under ultrasound has granularity that are caused by an internal inherent ultrasound artifacts that are known as speckles. And clusters of speckles are called kernels. Uh, those speckle arrangements are, are unique uh, for each region of the diaphragm and uh, very much like the spots on, on the dog. Uh, so ultrasound software can track those kernels and therefore is able to automatically measure the change in the distance uh, between two kernels, uh, the horizontal distance. And this, this is very well known or very much known in, in cardiac ultrasound and speckled tracking. Uh, so um, as, as a surrogate of uh, myocardial contractility. Uh, so uh, here's an example of speckled tracking using the diaphragm at, at end exhalation. Um, and in uh, on the left side here and, and in, uh, in end inhalation on the right side. The stronger the contraction of the diaphragm, the closer the kernels are going to move in together. And this is called strain. So the strain pattern using speckled tracking can predict, uh, can quantify uh, strength of, of contractility. So in this example here, uh, the ratio change, ratio of the change in the distance or the strain is calculated as 40 minus signal means it's just the, 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 this is a contract contraction rather than relaxation too. All right, so how, what does this look like? Uh, the machine does uh, the tracking and the machine does the calculation and in life, life scanning, uh, uh, the, the numbers are, are easy to see actually in real time. Uh, during loaded breathing, strain pattern was, was actually closely correlated with the di diaphragmatic pressure with an R square value of 0.7, uh, but di diaphragmatic thickening was not correlated in, in the study, in, in the study that was uh, reported here. And also uh, um, the uh, performance cutoff uh, for this technique is still, still unknown. So although there is a really nice correlation between the pressure generated by the diaphragm and the strain, uh, we, we, we still don't know if, uh, if this uh, relate translates to performance. So the second item of interest is uh, shear wave uh, elastography. And that's another technique that can look at muscles, assess their, uh, through, through their elastic properties or their contractility. Uh, you know, when a muscle tenses up, it becomes more rigid. So its elasticity changes. So an ultrasound being transmitted through a medium will affect the medium. And this will, and, and it will also affect it, and, and the ultrasound beam will be affected by the elastic properties of the medium also. So what are shear uh, waves? Shear waves are uh, ultrasound waves that are generated uh, within the structure of the tissue. And they are, uh, they are horizontal waves and perpendicular uh, relative to the longitudinal wave that's applied to the medium. 
So um, they're generated inside the, the medium because of the effect of ultrasound on the medium. Shear waves travel again perpendicular to the incident beam. So shear wave elastography relies on the estimate of the propagation velo velocity of the shear waves, so how fast the shear waves go. And this allows a calculation of a surrogate of elasticity called the shear modulus of the tissue being studied. The shear modulus provides estimate of muscle force. So and it so happens that uh, the diaphragm shear modulus uh, increases along with increase in, uh, in the airway pressure. And also uh, the mean uh, diaphragmatic uh, pressure uh, relates to the mean shear modulus of the diaphragm during closed airways maneuvers, so the MIF, and during inspiratory loading in, in healthy subjects. But there has been no study done on ventilated patients yet. And what it looks like in real time is, is like this. We, we, we just apply the algorithm uh, box in, in the area of interest. And then you can see here the uh, shear modulus of the diaphragm in red uh, in real time during respiratory uh, motion. And in this situation, the uh, shear modulus uh, of, of the diaphragm correlated really nicely with the airway pressure, the, the blue line on, on the on the bottom and uh, the pressure uh, of the of the diaphragm. So the pressure of the esophagus on the bottom, the pressure of the diaphragm on the top. They really tracked nicely together. So that's another interesting way you can you can use ultrasound to assess muscle strength. Uh, one more interesting approach is to um, to assess respiratory muscle uh, that came up recently is to evaluate the intercostal muscle with ultrasound, not particularly the diaphragm or not the diaphragm alone. Um, so you look at uh, the di uh, you look at the parasternal area right right across uh, right right uh, next to the sternum, and uh, and you you find the ribs and uh, just between the ribs before the pleural line and in this case there's a little bit of pleural fusion you have the intercostal muscle there and the three layers of the intercostal muscle the outer the inner and the innermost are are together you're not going to be able to distinguish them during inhalation the internal the external and the innermost contract and during exhalation the uh, the inner uh, intercostal muscle contracts um, so in here, um, you you uh, you're looking at the change in uh, in the in the width of the intercostal uh, muscles during the respiratory cycle, and uh, this is uh, this has uh, come up to be an interesting uh, thing to do because it's uh, absolutely easy to do. Uh, it has high reliability infra uh, in in inter observer. Uh, uh, and it can be uh, can be done with uh, the same linear probe that we're used to uh, we're used to using. So the parasternal intercostal muscle thickening was uh, uh, responsive to the level of ventilator assistance, ventilation assistance, and significantly higher in mechanically ventilated patients with diaphragmatic who had diaphragmatic dysfunction. So here you have healthy individuals and the thickness uh, fraction. And here you have individuals who are on on uh, on zero PEEP or on uh, pressure support of five and uh, PEEP of five, uh, pressure support of 10 and PEEP of five, pressure support 15 and PEEP of five, and pressure support of 20 and PEEP of five. And with it, you see, as you increase the pressure support of the patient, the thickness of the muscle or the amount of uh, uh, contractility of the muscle drops. Or you can think of it as in an opposite direction. The, the way the, when you remove pressure support, the muscle contracts uh, stronger and stronger. And also, uh, the pressure generating capacity of the diaphragm uh, or the diaphragm thickening fraction and the parasternal intercostal muscle thickening fraction were all associated with failure uh, of spontaneous breathing style in mechanically ventilated, in mechanically ventilated patients. So um, you have here a parameter, a threshold, and sensitivity and specificity, and you, you find that the pressure, uh, uh, the, uh, 
is uh, a threshold of pressure uh, in, in the in the airway. Um, so, sorry, the uh, the parasternal intercostal uh, thickening, parasternal intercostal uh, muscle thickening fraction. So the best parameter to predict uh, uh, to predict that had the highest sensitivity and highest specificity for uh, weaning from mechanical ventilation was the intercostal muscle thickening fraction divided by the diaphragmatic thickening fraction. And uh, in this case, uh, the sensitivity was 100% with an inter, uh, with a confidence interval of 85 to 100%, and the specificity was 78%, uh, which means that if the person has a a, uh, a thickening fraction of the intercostal muscle that was uh, that was high compared to the diaphragm, then that means you're reliant on intercostal muscle rather than the diaphragm for breathing, and that means you're going to fail in extubation. So high sensitivity will rule out successful uh, extubation. So that that's how it's uh, that's how this parameter is used. So the take home points for this talk are. Uh, First, that the uh, diaphragmatic muscle function assessment is important in weaning from the ventilator. It's only part of the weaning process, not, not the whole story, because weaning depends on the workload and diaphragmatic properties. Second is that paradoxical diaphragmatic movement can be used uh, using ultrasound excursion, but, uh, the, uh, but looking at diaphragmatic excursion just to assess diaphragmatic function has not fared out to to be a good parameter. Diaphragmatic thickness does not correlate to function, uh, but thickening fraction, especially low thickening fraction, may predict poor function, but not failure of wing. And that uh, there are uh, a couple of new uh, techniques that can look at diaphragmatic contactility, uh, that is speckle tracking and elastography. Uh, and the uh, newest thing is really looking at the intercostal muscle thickening fraction comparing this to the diaphragmatic thickening fraction in uh, predicting successful extubation. There are only, there are only uh, two studies on that, and we'll, we'll you know, look for more before we say this is really uh, a good item to use. All right, so that, that's all. I'll see if, uh, if there are any questions.